Recent growth in East London has doubled transport demands and is putting a strain on existing congested crossings. Thames Crossing Limited aims to sustainably address this issue by determining the optimum location and nature of a new crossing, east of Blackwell Tunnel, on the basis of user demand and constraints of ground conditions. Our research consists of seven main building blocks. The first phase of the project is comprised of detailed mapping of existing crossings to develop an appreciation of the current transport system and its capacity. Previous projects were also examined to cover existing groundwork and understand why they haven't been successful. The first building block is appreciating the current situation. This map illustrates existing crossings in green and previously proposed crossings in purple. As can be observed, there are six existing crossings, but only two for road traffic, the Blackwall Tunnel to the west and the Woolwich Ferry to the east, the next crossing being 20 kilometres downstream. In the past, there have been four main proposed projects. The Thames Gateway crossing was proposed in the 70s, but was cancelled in 2008 due to the financial crisis. New projects have since been proposed, including a new DLR crossing at Galleon Reach, a new tunnel at Silvertown and a Woolwich Ferry replacement. Our initial research into the geology of the project area has revealed a complex stratigraphy consisting of a number of different soils, each representing their own engineering challenges. A number of faults have also been shown to exist within the London Basin, hinting at possible tectonic influence within our area. Reports and documentation of past projects, such as the Jubilee Line Extension and Woolwich DLR, has allowed us to understand and predict challenges that may arise during the development of the new Thames Crossing. Many past projects have struggled with the complex geology of the area with problems caused by hard chalk flints and water retentive soils such as the Lambeth Group and Thanet Sands. Our ground model is useful to visualise these complex ground conditions. The first step in ground modelling is to obtain the borehole information from the British Geological Survey website. Only boreholes deeper than 20 metres are of interest. Also, due to the immense number of boreholes, borehole data were taken at roughly every 50 metres. However, more should be obtained if a soil layer from neighbouring boreholes are distinctly not at the same level. The next step is to input the information into Excel and reformat it for use with the MOVE software. The important information are Nording, Easting, Soil Type Code, Grain Size and Log of Grain Size. The MOVE software will then be utilised to produce the ground model to identify any geotechnical hazard. The last step is to compare our ground model with the information obtained from our case studies. This is to ensure we interpreted the borehole logs accurately. After a brainstorm of potential crossing ideas, we agreed that either a bridge or a tunnel is the best plan as they allow for free flowing traffic and therefore reduce the likelihood of congestion. The examples shown are for a double-decker tunnel system being used effectively in both Australia and Russia. Taking this design into account, our first proposal shows a similar double-decker system which can be used to separate north and southbound traffic flows while having a high capacity all inside one tunnel. Using a total of six lanes to match the number used by the local main roads will prevent a bottleneck occurring as is the situation at the current Blackwell Tunnel. A second tunnel idea is to use two or even three tunnels. A geotechnical advantage to this is that the horizontal zone of influence is reduced. Multiple tunnels also allows for efficient separation of traffic types. An example of such a system is the Channel Tunnel, which consists of a northbound tunnel, a southbound tunnel and a further third tunnel for maintenance access. Our proposal based on this shows double and triple tunnel systems, both of which allow for separating freight and buses from smaller traffic, while also allowing easier maintenance access. Such a system also benefits planning escape routes, which are of vital importance should an accident occur. Alongside tunnels, we also looked at several case studies for bridge designs. Most bridges along the Thames use a traditional arch support, a system also used in the shown example Gladsville Bridge in Australia. Despite height and clearance restrictions imposed by shipping lanes and the local London City Airport, we are not limited to this type of system. The sketches shown here are basic representations of various bridge designs that we considered. All have proven to be effective by various examples around the world. However, the Trust Tide Arch support system is the most appealing to us and could easily be used for the span we require, approximately 500 metres. 
An example of such a system is the Chia Tianmen Bridge in China. This gives an idea of how such a bridge could look. This design will allow us to build within the applied height restrictions while providing an aesthetically pleasing design that is unlike any other bridge currently in London. For the deck of the bridge, the double-decker concept first suggested for a tunnel can also be applied. Depending on the user demand, the levels can be designated to various users as shown by these two sketches. The bridge on the left shows pedestrians on the upper level in an almost park-like environment, whereas the right-hand sketch shows traffic on both levels. The overall design of the crossing will become more specific once data on the ground conditions and current traffic situation has been processed. The Thames Gateway crossing is a solution for the current East London situation, a problem consisting of many variables. Therefore, in order to find the most suitable solution, we have to critically assess all the facts and aspects of the problem. The best outcome will be the one satisfying the requirements in the most sustainable and economically efficient way. For the purpose of the project, a plan has been prepared describing the next steps, the different aspects that need to be considered, and the way that everything is combined. The plan also shows the iterative nature of the design process, having to find a balance between assessing the feasibility and the optimization of the design. All steps from ground modeling to financial analysis will need to be considered. For the most efficient micromanagement of the team, a Gantt chart has been prepared. The chart, together with the project plan, show the next objective for the group. For instance, the ground profile should be completed by the end of week 2 to allow the final design to begin and potential locations for the crossing to be chosen.